Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50 percent. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's board of governors and your moderator for today. This is another one of the club's virtual series on the coronavirus in association with the Zetima Project. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to stay informed on other programs, both about the virus and other topics. These presentations are free, and I want to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the collaborative of local donors who've helped support this one in particular. We're grateful for their support. And as you heard Dan Ashley just say, we encourage you to follow their lead. Thank you in advance for that. Today is July 15th, 2020. And I wanna make a point of mentioning that because those listening later via podcast or radio need to know things, uh, the date because things are happening so quickly. Eight weeks ago on May 20th, I hosted a program here for the club called Reopening America, how fast is too fast? And at that point, uh, we had 1.6 million cases of COVID-19 in America and 94,000 deaths. And you may recall states had just begun reopening a few weeks earlier. As of today, we have three and a half million cases and 140,000 deaths. Most disturbingly, the resurgence of the virus seems to be accelerating with cases per million in Arizona, Florida, and Louisiana exceeding even what we saw earlier in the pandemic in New York and New Jersey. National case growth rate, case growth rate is running 60% above the April high. So as you all know, at this point, we have recently seen pauses or even reversals of the reopenings. Both red and blue states recently have required businesses to close and reimpose restrictions on social gatherings. Uh, here in California, the Los Angeles and San Diego school districts just announced that they will not bring students back in person in the fall. So this is not a very positive picture, and I can't promise that you will leave this session happier. However, I am confident you will leave better informed. We have two experts here to help us understand what we should do and where we are likely to go from here, and it's now my pleasure to introduce them to you. 
Dr. Ashish Jha is Professor of Global Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, as well as Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jha leads national analysis of key issues around the pandemic, advising policymakers and elected officials at both the state and federal levels. He also occurs, uh, appears frequently on CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and other news outlets. He's a vocal advocate for increased testing and contact tracing, two issues we'll be talking about today. And he's written extensively in a whole variety of publications, ranging from the New England Journal of Medicine, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, and many other places. Welcome, Dr. Jha. We also have Dr. Bob Kosher, whom I've gotten to know through our work on the Zetima Project. He is a partner at the venture capital firm Venrock, and Bob has an exceptionally broad view of U.S. healthcare because he's not only a healthcare investor, but also a practicing physician, an economist, and a former policy advisor in the Obama White House during the development of the Affordable Care Act. These days, he's not doing much of any of those things because he's spending so much time as a member of the California Coronavirus Testing Task Force. And back in April, Bob co-authored a bipartisan plan to reopen the economy that was somewhat more aggressive than some of the others, and his views naturally have evolved ever since then. And I think all of us have been humbled in trying to understand and contain this virus. So I'm looking forward to an update on his thoughts about that plan. Now, as you also heard from Dan Ashley, you are welcome to and encouraged to submit questions for our panelists, which will be texted to me. And I will try to uh, incorporate as many of them as possible into the program. So let's jump right in. Ashish Jha, let's start with our current situation. It's bad, but how bad? And I also want to know, how do you judge how bad it is? Is it the case count? Is it the death count? Is it hospitalizations, the proportional of hospital beds that are being used or, or something else? Yeah. So, Mark, thanks for having me on. Um, I guess when I look across these United States, I see uh, states in three buckets. And California is a little funny because it's in two buckets in some ways. It's kind of some parts of California look like one, some parts of California look like other because it's a very big state. But if we take a look nationally, uh, in very simple terms, about a third of the states are uh, sort of, I would say, kind of ankle deep in this, in this flood. Uh, about a third of the states are waist deep and about a third of the states are neck deep. So let's start with the bad ones and then we'll come back. So the, the third that are neck deep are the, you guys know it, it's the Arizona, it's the Texas, Florida, South Carolina. I'm not going to list them all. Um, they are in serious trouble and they're in serious trouble because by and large, they have exponential growth happening. Uh, their hospital capacity is really getting stretched and they have still not put in the kinds of measures that you would need to truly cut off and kind of you know, plateau the curve, just to use a, a phrase that people have used a lot. And what I, the, and one of the key points that people need to understand is anything you're seeing today in terms of new infections, uh, certainly new hospitalizations, uh, you are essentially, it's always rear view mirror. Those infections happened between one and three weeks ago. And so if you're getting full now, you've got a couple of weeks of infections, rising infections already baked into the system. Uh, I am deeply worried about what is happening in those, uh, let's say, a third of the states. And there are parts of California that look like that, though, actually, I would say if we were having this conversation last week, I would have been like, I want to see more aggressive policy action. I think in the last few days, we've started seeing that. And I'm very pleased. The way steep states are, uh, there's, there are a lot of them uh, from Ohio. There are a lot of them in the Midwest. So the, the, the third that are neck deep, mostly in the South, a few uh, elsewhere. A lot of states in the Midwest, uh, middle of the country, parts of the West that are kind of more waist deep. Uh, it, it, infections are clearly going up. Hospitalizations are clearly going up. They're not in exponential growth. And they can make relatively smart policy actions, ratchet back certain types of activities, and I think have a pretty good shot of getting out of it. And then you have about a third of the states where the ankle deep, where, yeah, they've got a few infections, but things are in generally good shape. Hospitalizations are down. Mortality is down. Plenty of hospital capacity. And the key strategy for them is essentially to protect the gains, to not do bad policies that get them going in the wrong direction. So that's where we are, uh, three very different pictures uh, of the state of the outbreak in the country. And how do you measure? Is it cases, hospitalizations, deaths? You know, it's interesting, right? So I, I think the issue with this is that you can look at any one measure and get fooled. And so I'll tell you what I do. Literally every night, 
Uh, I look at the data that comes out of the COVID tracking project. Uh, I have one of my analysts just crunch some of those numbers. And I look at four numbers. I look at cases, total and new cases. Uh, I look at tests. Um, based on tests and cases, I can look at something called percent positive, which helps me understand kind of how wide a net are we casting, helps me contextualize cases. And then what I know clinically is that after people get infected, it's going to be a week or 10 days before hospitalizations go up. And then I know clinically it's going to be another couple of weeks before those people start dying. So I know those are lagging indicators and I will look at hospitalizations and deaths as well. And this has played out in the last month or six weeks. It has played out like clockwork, like textbook. We saw cases go up. We saw percent positives go up. We saw hospitalizations followed. And now we're seeing mortality go up. This is exactly what you would expect when you have out of control outbreaks. And do most people who die spend time in the hospital before they die of COVID? Yeah, that's how we're meant. At least that's how we're capturing it. We do think that, and here is where it gets a little controversial how much, but I will say 20 to 30 percent uh, additional deaths if we could identify all the folks who are dying at home with, um, without getting uh, tested. So there is clearly excess mortality. Uh, some people are dying at home. They never made it in. They never got tested. They never get qual- counted as a COVID death. But the bottom line is uh, that they do have, uh, they did die of that. And, and that's kind of our best guess. It's not a massive number, but it would meaningfully increase the number of deaths. Mm-hmm. Now, Bob, I know a lot of us looked at some of the southern states when they reopened and said, wow, they're not being very careful. And uh, Californians were so proud of how well California did. We were the first state to impose shelter in place restrictions and so forth. And yet we're still seeing a big resurgence. I think you just told me we had 11,000 new cases. What went wrong here? Uh, we opened too soon. Uh, very simply, um, I think people got overconfident. We had the initial rise like New York and we acted quickly and actually a day or two earlier than New York and shut down businesses across California. Um, and it worked exactly as you would have expected. If you have people not contact other people, the virus doesn't spread as quickly. Um, if you kind of step back, um, this is just math and biology. We have a virus that people breathe out. And if you walk into the cloud for a long time, if somebody is breathing out the virus, it will infect you. It's very simple. And this virus has an r naught or infectivity of each person infecting between two and three more people. And so the only way to not have that virus spread is to take people who are infected and have them stay home until they're not breathing out the virus anymore. And in California, we proved that works. So we shut down the state and people did a great job staying at home. It was breathtaking to see the change in traffic patterns and mobility. Uh, and when I was working with the state, we benefited from seeing getting data contributed to us by um, people who collect data and, and we saw it work and, and people who live in California, you know, observed it. The streets were empty. The stores were closed and our virus infection rate went way down, got below one. And that was exactly what we had hoped for. And as we did that, we were buying time to set up testing and scale up testing in California to create a contact tracing program, but we got impatient. And so people began saying, look, like the hospitals have plenty of space. They were screaming, like, let me do more surgeries. Let's reopen the hospitals. People were saying, I'm missing, I'm going to the beach. I, 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 I want to, you know, form bubbles and go do things. And so we relented and we reopened. Uh, and exactly what you would expect happened, math and biology occurred. People came into contact with each other. People were breathing out the virus. People were catching the virus by being more open. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we reopened before, and this was true in every state, before contact tracing was really up and running. Um, if, you were, if we did this show in, in May and June, we would have been talking about, what do you think of the Apple and Google contact tracing apps? Are they going to work? Are they going to be great? And the problem is, is that nobody's launched those yet. Like We have not created that contact tracing program. And the reason why Asia opened up and it worked okay is that they stayed closed long enough to have their case counts be very low. And then when they reopened, they had stunningly good testing and contact tracing. So each person who who was newly infected in other countries, hours after that test result comes back, they are either kept at home or taken to a place that's safe for them to quarantine. Uh, And then all of their contacts are tested immediately. And those who are infected are also similarly isolated. And if you Mm -hmm. isolate the infected people, the virus can't spread. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you reopen. 
And America chose to reopen before we had that bill. California has just now completed the hiring of the contact tracing workforce. But when you hire 10,000 people and say, welcome to your new job, take some time to train them. And so we haven't got the benefits of that infrastructure and that investment yet. And, and we're only staffed to contact trace about 3,000 people a day. And so when you have 11,000 cases, you can't possibly catch up. So that is why the governor, out of necessity, shut, back, shut down much of the state. But we shouldn't be comfortable until the case counts are much, much lower because contact tracing can't contain a virus that's sort of spreading at this rate. It was Shisha's you know, knowledge. Like some of California is waist deep, but some of us, some of it's neck deep. And we have to be sort of ankle deep to have contact tracing work. Exactly. Right, right. And, and Ashish, I know that some states are doing much better than others. New York, of course, which was hit so hard initially and the hospitals were overwhelmed. They, they did shut down. And as of Sunday, they recorded their first day in four months with zero COVID deaths, which is terrific. Several of the northeastern states are doing well. So given what Bob just said, and first of all, let us know if you agree or disagree. But then what does that mean for what we should do? Should, should states be shutting down as aggressively as possible right now? Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit about shutting down. I think Bob's uh, analogy or, or his notion that this is simple biology and math is completely right. And so the question is, when you are when you are Arizona, when you are Texas, how do you get this under control? Uh, there's only one way: you got to get infected people away from uninfected people. Uh, testing and tracing lets you do that when the numbers are not massive, but when the numbers numbers are massive. Like, I don't even know how you create a testing and tracing program that could possibly get you there on its own. It, even in those situations, I still think testing and tracing is helpful as an additive. It just helps bring it down a little bit. But ultimately, what you need to do is separate people. And the best way to separate people, the most aggressive is to do shelter in place. I, you know, look, uh, shelter in place orders are incredibly costly, right? We, what do we know? They have huge economic effects. Uh, people lose jobs. People lose businesses. Domestic violence goes up. Uh, child abuse goes up. I mean, shelter in place is like the worst possible uh, policy and you only want to implement it when you have no other choice. Like I, you know, people, I, I am not casual about talking about a, a total shutdown of a state. The problem is if you don't take this virus seriously, you are left with that as your choice. And not doing it means you have runaway virus, you have overwhelmed hospitals, lots of people dying. So the, that is possibly the only worse outcome that shelter in place. So, but the point of shelter in place, there are two, and, and actually Bob makes a really important point. Um, there's a big debate about, did we open up too soon or did we open up too much? And my, ans my answer to that debate is yes. And we definitely opened up too much, but the too soon part is the point of shelter in place. The reason why you tolerate all the costs is to build up the infrastructure you need. And I have to tell you that I think a lot of the country did get impatient. When I look at what's happening here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and New York, um, we are in much, much better shape. We did, we were much more careful about opening up, um, you know, but I still can't go to an indoor restaurant in most places. Um, that said, um, we still aren't where we want to be and need to be on testing and tracing, even in Massachusetts, which arguably has been the kind of leader on tracing. So it's a pretty tough business. Um, but we got to keep plugging away at it because it's what allows us to open up our economy. I think it's going to be really fundamental if we want to try to open up schools. I know L.A., San Diego, I heard that San Francisco just announced uh, they're going to be online only. Uh, to me, these are uh, these are awful decisions. And I'm not criticizing. I'm saying they're awful in the sense that, you know, th there are going to be awful consequences. I understand why schools are making it. Testing and tracing is a really important part of keeping virus levels low enough so that you can open up schools, so that you can open up your economy um, prudently. Yeah. Well, I agree with Ashish's framing of shelter in place as a blunt instrument with many bad consequences. Um, maybe even worse than that is the place where we are now, right? which is where we actually didn't shelter in place long enough to put in place the new things we have to do to actually more safely reopen. And I think more likely now, there was a paper talking about the hammer and the dance where, you know, you open, things get out of control, you shut down and beat it back again. And, and that cycle um, is even worse than a shelter in place because you keep breaking things as you, you know, shut them down again. And that's even worse for small business. And, and the state that we're in right now and much of the country that sort of either waste or neck deep is in this sort of in-between state where we're disrupting commerce tremendously 
or hurting every single business because it's sort of half open and doesn't know what the rules are going to be and it's spending money on bucks of glass shields that may or may not make sense and doesn't know if they need to buy a new air conditioner. Um, we're in this in-between spot that's going to last longer and be worse, I think, than actually a more Asian or European style shelter in place. Now, some of the things that she said about shelter in place, we can improve. So we can do things about food security. We can do things about loneliness and isolation. We can, I mean, with telemedicine, you can bring care into the home. And so I don't think we were very creative as a country. And now we've had time to start thinking. Uh, we're not, we shouldn't be just reacting. And so I think we should think about how to make the hard actions that we have to do better on schools. Um, I'm a proponent of not opening schools on time, in person, as if they were before. Um, I think we need to spend several weeks making school safer. And so we should pick what is the right start date for in-person school. And then we need to be a lot more ambitious and creative. We should be using libraries and churches and other modern ventilated buildings. We should be making schools smaller so you don't put 3,000 kids together in one place. We should think about creating a statewide virtual school system so each district isn't trying to set up their own version of virtual school. Yeah. Uh, we do need to have some testing in place for both the faculty and the students. There's a bunch of work you could do to make schools dramatically safer and better. Um, some of Ashish's college put out, put out a paper, I think today, um, for TH Chan about how you actually redesign schools to make them safer. And while yeah. you can't make schools perfectly safe, um, we owe it to our teachers and our students to, to put our national effort into actually a reimagination of what is the school so we can have in-person instruction, which is definitely better. But, mm -hmm. but, but yeah. we, shouldn't, we shouldn't rush to say on, on, the, on the current first day, we should open yeah. or not. That is not the way to think about schools. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little more about schools in a moment, but it sounds like overall I'd summarize saying that we've really been doing the wrong thing at the wrong time and we've been doing it badly. So besides that- And, 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 and impatiently. And impatiently, yeah. Bob, one question I wanted to ask you, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on uh, is because you're both a doctor and a health policy advisor as well as an economist and a venture capitalist. So you know the healthcare system, you care about the healthcare system, and you also have a you know, real dog in the hunt in making sure the economy is working well. And in the polarization of this whole discussion politically, it seems like many people think it's one or the other, and, and maybe it is. Do you think it's a tension between the health and the economy, or do you think that both are pulling us in the same direction? No, I think there's real tension. I, like the, the actions that we've taken to try to reduce the interactions of infected people and unaffected people are, are very harmful to commerce. And, and so uh, we're, we are making a choice um, to prioritize saving lives of people who will die from this, from this virus um, at the expense of the incomes of people who run businesses, strictly small businesses. Uh, and so I, I think there is real tension. Um, there's tension uh, between as we have, as we reduce commerce, people's incomes go down. Some of them, 5 million people have lost insurance, despite the fact that we have the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion in many states. There's still 5 million newly pe new people uninsured, don't have access to care. Um, there's some people who had to buy new insurance, so now they have new deductibles that are high, and it's more expensive for them to access care. Uh, there's a bunch of tension between doing the right thing to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and protect the lives of people who would have died, many of whom were poor old, uh, with reducing the economic opportunity for Americans who, you know, many, most of whom work in smaller businesses. And so I, I think, unfortunately, the, the rope is being tugged, you know, in opposite directions, which is why it's so hard for governors uh, to know what to do. Uh, yeah. Conversely, if you're gonna have businesses reopen, um, until we have immunity, there's a bunch of modifications that, that are prudent to make to protect the workers and protect the people who want to engage with the businesses. And those require capital investment, whether it's the redesign of schools I was just foreshadowing or redesigning how you dine. Uh, you know, this requires capital. And the government has been, you know, pumping capital into the economy to keep it, to keep it afloat. But we haven't actually yet sort of made the investments in changing how business is conducted um, as holistically as we need to, to allow businesses to, to you know, to, to really get back on their feet. And this notion of hammer and dance that I mentioned is going to be particularly bad because every time you think you're getting started, we're going to close again. Yeah, just going back and forth is a challenge. Now, she, she talked about looking at the data every night, and we just heard that uh, the government, the federal government has asked that the 
deaths be reported and the cases be reported directly to HHS rather than to the CDC, which is part of HHS. Can you comment on whether you think that's a good, bad idea or indifferent? Still trying to sort it out. And um, and generally, we like to see these data go to the CDC uh, because they are the National Clearinghouse. They have the experts who can do this. And CDC forever has been a nonpartisan, uh, apolitical public health agency. And so if there is a compelling argument for why the CDC is not the right spot, uh, we need to hear about it. Uh, what we're hearing is that it's going to a company uh, that's going to be managing it that doesn't have much experience with managing this kind of data. Uh, and so that makes me a little anxious. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, wherever the data goes, it's got to be available to the public because your taxpayer, uh, your tax dollars and mine are paying for all this data to be collected and reported. And therefore, we all need to be able to see it. So that's the part that probably concerns me the most is how, you know, how available will this data be to the American people? Um, obviously, my feeling is if the CDC can't, isn't doing a good enough job managing it, help them fix it. Work with the CDC to make it better. Um, but you really have to have a very compelling argument for why you want to bring in somebody else. But the principles of open, transparent data absolutely have to be there. Thanks. Let's talk about testing, Bob. This is a topic you've been spending a lot of time on with the California Task Force. I know initially when, of course, the virus broke, the pandemic started, we didn't have enough tests. So a lot of states tried some initiatives. California got going and got a lot of tests. But I just read a news story last night that quoted you, actually, that talked about California facing testing shortages. So tell us about texting, uh, testing capacity in California and what you know about nationally. And are we doing enough testing? And, and also, if someone is being is, gets tested, how fast do they get the results and is that sufficient? Sure. Uh, you have lots of questions in your question. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me start with a simple answer. Yeah. Um, we are not doing enough testing in California or anywhere in the country. Uh, one of the really challenging aspects of COVID-19 is about a third of people who are infected with the virus do not perceive symptoms. They may have them, but they might be the symptoms that are not so obvious. And so um, we need to be testing a large cross-section of the population regularly to pick up those people who are unknowingly spreading the virus so we can isolate them and not have them infect other people. Uh, and that means that you have to be testing asymptomatic people as well as people who have symptoms. Um, any person who has a fever or a cough needs to be tested for COVID-19 and other things to find out what's causing that. Uh, and so you need to be able to have rapid testing of anybody who perceives a need, as well as those who think they've been exposed, and then also people who actually don't think they've been exposed, but actually might be carrying the virus. Uh, and so anything that reduces access to testing right now, I think is a poor policy choice, given everything we've learned. Um, in California, um, we've done a good job um, at scaling up our testing capacity. Uh, the governor formed a public-private testing task force uh, co-chaired by Paul Markovich and Dr. Charity Dean uh, that I helped create um, in March. And our mission was to take California from 2,000 tests per day, which was embarrassing, uh, to more than 80,000 tests a day. Uh, thankfully, we surpassed that goal and California has been averaging about 110,000 tests per day for the last week or so. And our highest testing day was about 130, 137,000 tests a week ago. And so California has really improved our testing and we learned a couple of things. In California, um, we have actually a lot of installed capacity. So um, if we had full access to all the supplies we need, we could do about 400,000 PCR tests a day in California, uh, which is terrific. We could meet our needs. Uh, and so that was great. Um, and so we learned that we had enough installed lab space to do the test like the machines. Um, we then discovered that we didn't have enough sample collection materials. Um, COVID-19 tests, most of them involve the world's most expensive Q-tip called a flock swab. Uh, that are made in two places in the world, uh, and the whole world wants to buy them. And so we were out of those flock swabs. And so in California, we managed to create some new supply by having people 3D print them, uh, and then found some sources in China, and we bought 22, 22 million of those swabs. So we reduced sort of the sample collection bottleneck. Um, then we discovered that actually there weren't enough places to get your sample collected. So if you had a fever and lived in Fresno, you know, you could go to the ER or drive to Davis. There wasn't enough places to get the test done. So the state then launched 120 new sample collection sites around the state. So to make sure people could actually get a sample collected, uh, we then worked with insurance companies to waive all the cost sharing so you wouldn't be scared. You couldn't afford the test. 
And then finally, we expanded the guidelines, actually broader than the current one, saying anyone who wants a test can get one. So you didn't feel like you had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get that test done. And all those things together worked. Um, what we're running into now is the fact that so many states are waist to neck deep in COVID-19, that demand for testing in America and the earth is growing at the exponential rate at which COVID-19 is growing. And ca manufacturing capacity of the supplies to make tests are growing at the linear rate that people can do Six Sigma and lean re-engineering of manufacturing facilities. And so we have a real problem that we're about to run into in the world of too much demand and not enough supply. And so there's a couple of ways we can get around that, um, both of which we're pursuing in California. And you've begun hearing the federal government talk about both too. Um, the first is a technique called sample pooling. We do this for blood banks and for other tests where you take several samples and actually combine them into one. And then you run one test. And if that sample's negative, you're quite sure that everybody's negative because the, the tests that we do for COVID-19 are super sensitive and pick up very, you know, they're very, very good tests. Um, if they're positive, then you have to go back and individually check each of the samples. But if you do that, you can you can add about 200% capacity at least to your labs um, right away. And so that would really help with supplies. The other thing we need to do is use new testing techniques. And so one of the most promising ones, which the FDA has just approved, is called next generation sequencing, which is where we use all the machines that the country has bought to do genetic screening of cancers and the Human Genome Project to actually go sequence the virus. Those machines are awesome because they're very fast, they're very high throughput, and they use different supplies than the current supply chains. And so that will add a lot more capacity as well. And so I think we have a way around the near-term supply problem if we use pooling and new testing techniques. That said, um, the third problem we have to grapple with is the price. The tests today are expensive. And so the idea that some people have that we should be testing all high risk people every couple of days or everybody in a bubble of the NBA like every day, um, it doesn't work when the tests are between $100 and $200 per, per shot. Uh, and so we have to then find ways to drive down the price so we can afford to do the number of tests that we should be doing. And so I have hope that if we adopt pooling and next gen sequencing that we won't run, off a, run over a cliff here of not having enough PCR kits but if we don't get with that plan quickly, I think there'll be real problems in the fall. Is that a, is that a federal problem, a state problem, or where, how is it best solved, I guess I'd say? It's both. So the federal government needs to have the FDA um, issue guidance on exactly how to do pooling. Right now, it's very difficult for the labs to get permission. They have to go through a complex process of validation and FDA approval. Uh, which is hard for a lab to do that's already running at 100% capacity trying to keep up with the tests that are coming in. On next-gen sequencing, um, these technologies have recently been approved, but nobody knows how to sort of collect the samples and operationalize them. And so there has to be work done by states um, and the private sector to figure out how do you collect samples, send them to these labs and turn them around because these labs aren't used to actually doing kind of direct-to-consumer testing. They're really academic, more research institutions. And so they don't have the... the the consumer aspects that they need to sort of run millions of tests. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if I or someone has, uh, has the symptoms of COVID, but they just can't get the test, does it really matter? Should they just say, look, I probably have COVID. Let me act as though I do. Well, I <laughs> hope if you think you have COVID that you get tested, but if not, I hope you stay home, yeah. uh, not affect other people. Um, but it does matter because um, we would want to be able to do contact tracing. And so if you know you have COVID, um, people other than you would actually reach out to the people you've exposed to help them get tested. Uh, and so that's a very important aspect for why it's worth being tested at all. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is a lot of people have said they thought they've had COVID, but they didn't. And we certainly wouldn't want you to behave as if you did and think that you might be immune um, because then that will undermine all the efforts we're making to actually physically distance and protect people from spreading the virus. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and moreover, we aren't sure if you've had COVID actually what that means to you getting COVID again. Um, we all have great hope that there'll be some protection and it might last for some period of time, but it simply isn't the case that if you've had COVID once that you can then sort of live a life that may have been pre-COVID normal. We just don't know enough yet on that. Yeah. Right. That's unfortunate. Uh, Ashish, you know, when we reopened a few months ago, we saw the case rates rise as you predicted, particularly among younger adults. Initially, death rates fell, but of course, that could just be a lagging issue. And, and then it seems like more recently, much more recently, we've seen uh, death rates rise again. 
Do we know if those deaths are among the older people, uh, the younger people who are sick, or did they get uh, older people sick? Yeah, uh, good, good question. So it's a complicated picture, and let me see if I can kind of tease it apart. Um, one of the problems has been that we've been looking at national death rates. And national death rates for the last couple of months, until about three weeks ago, was primarily driven by the enormous number of deaths in New York and New Jersey and Massachusetts. And so because those deaths were falling all throughout June, and deaths in other, part of the country, other parts were pretty flat, it looked the whole, like the whole country was still coming down. And so there was this disconnect where cases were rising and deaths were falling nationally. But, the, but then what happened was as deaths started rising in the, in the hotspot states, the early numbers are always going to be small and they were not nearly as big as what was going down. And so then you sort of saw rising in some, falling in another, and essentially looked like the deaths had flattened. And we still had this narrative of, oh, deaths aren't going up. But you would not expect outbreaks in Arizona to be causing death increases in New York. You'd expect them to be going on increasing deaths in Arizona. And when you and we did this last week, about 10 days ago, when we really started looking carefully at deaths in the hotspot states, it was very clear that deaths were going up, even though nationally the numbers were pretty flat or going down. Right. So essentially you have two stories. Like, what, I mean, it's sort of like the waist, the neck deep and the, uh, and the ankle deep. The ankle deep states had mortality falling. The neck deep states had mortality rising and the country looked flat. OK, so then the question is, um, what's driving to your second part of your question, what's driving mortality in Arizona, Florida, and Texas? Is it young people eventually starting to die or is it spreading to older people? When in early June, we started seeing the spikes and it was young people and people said, well, isn't this all just good news? I said, no, two reasons. Young people do get sick. They do occasionally die, um, thankfully much less often. Um, but second is it turns out young people hang out with old people. They often live with older people. Um, they, they're often related to older people. And so what starts in young people in bars and restaurants will make its way to older people. And now we're seeing pretty good data from Florida, and from Texas, uh, that the infections are, the median age is rising and more older people have been getting infected. I, on the question of who's dying, it's a combination of there are more young people who are dying in this, this second phase of this outbreak, uh, but you definitely are starting to see more older people get infected and die as well. So it's a, it's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, it is worth remembering that young people in their 30s and 40s, if you infect enough of them, you will still overwhelm hospitals. They will get enough of them will get sick enough uh, to, to you know, potentially end up in the hospital or die. So uh, it's a complex picture, but that's what's going on. And in California, 25 percent of our deaths have been in people below age 65. Very and so um, sure. They have a lower percentage. They have lower mortality, but it is. As she says, many of them go to the hospital. Um, I just had a dear friend who was in his 40s just get a search from the ICU uh, with COVID-19. He was a physician who, who contracted COVID-19. Uh, and so um, it's, it's a much more serious illness, I think, than many people believe for those people who develop symptoms. Well, one more point on that is that, you know, with people, there's hospitalizations which could lead to death or could not lead to death. What do we know about lasting health consequences of people who survive COVID-19? We, we, we know a decent, I mean, no, I shouldn't do it. We know some, we don't know as much as I would like, of course. So there's a really nice paper last week in JAMA, two weeks ago, I, did, I don't know when, sometime in the last couple of weeks, um, that looked at uh, people who were discharged uh, alive uh, from hospitals in Italy, median age of 56, so about half the people were under 56. And what they found was that 87% of those people two months later still had symptoms. Uh, about half of them were still feeling really short of breath. About two thirds of them had really substantial fatigue. This is not a week after hospitalization, right? Discharge. This is two months after discharge. So I, it has made me, uh, made me much less cavalier about this idea that if you survived it, you're going to be fine. Um, the amount of lung damage you see on people's CAT scans uh, makes me very worried about the long-term effects of these people's um, functional status. Uh, we've had this approach of well. You know, NBA players, it's not a big deal if they get infected. NBA players sort of survive on the, the, the elite ones on being able to run up and down the court for 48 minutes. Uh, even if they don't die, if they get substantial lung damage, like that's a pretty big deal for a lot of them. So I feel like uh, this disease is much more serious, even among people who survive, uh, than I think we've often thought it is.
-hmm. In that same paper, there was um, an important discussion too about the fact that people after they're discharged from hospitals continue to form blood clots. Uh, yes. And that leads to a bunch of complications around your body. Uh, and so there's big worries that you have a propensity to make blood clots for, for weeks after. Uh, and now patients leaving hospitals are very often um, anticoagulated uh, mm. for a period of time after they're discharged because of that other risk. And so the lung damage and the clotting risks are quite unique and worrisome. Uh, and so we know that, and that's just in people, you know, two months after a hospitalization. Remember, yeah. this is a disease that's less than 180 days old. Yeah, and we so don't know. In terms of what we know about it. And yeah. so we do not know, uh, you know, how long these complications last, um, yeah. whether or not it makes it susceptible for other things in the future. And so um, what we have learned so far is that actually it's worse than we thought. Well, that's not very encouraging. Now, I want to go back to what we were talking about, the age issues. And yes, young people do live with older people in the community. What's interesting is a very significant chunk, maybe 35, 40, 45 percent of the people who died from, from COVID have been nursing home residents. Right, who are not in the community, they're in nursing homes. And certainly initially when we heard that, we thought, well, the good news there is we can isolate them so they won't get COVID. And yet we've known this for four or five months, we have been unsuccessful in bringing that death rate down. So I guess the question is, is it unrealistic to expect that nursing homes can somehow prevent these infections unless the rest of us are somehow sheltering in place or all wearing masks or whatever we need to do? So I'll tell you what I understand about the data and, and I'm sure Bob has um, important insight insights here as well. Um, the biggest predictor of whether a nursing home is going to have an outbreak is the size of the outbreak in the community. And that stands to reason because it turns out you can try to isolate nursing homes, uh, but nursing homes need workers. They need nurses, occasionally doctors and a lot of healthcare aides. And these people live in the community. And uh, a lot of them will, if, if you have a large outbreak happening in your community, you'll get people who get the infection. They might be asymptomatic. They will come to work. They feel fine. And they will infect other people. Uh, that is the reality of how this stuff works. And so protecting nursing homes without protecting the workers is very, very, very difficult. Now, there are, you could imagine, and I have been you know, saying that we, in the ideal world, if we could have really ubiquitous testing and we could do other things. You could imagine you could have a program where every worker gets tested, you know, on a regular basis. And that would offer a level of protection that we have not had the level of testing that we need as a country, despite, I mean, Bob's efforts, by the way, I know this is not meant about praising other people on the panel, but mm -hmm. what Bob and, and California has done has been nothing short of extraordinary. Even there, I mean, they have more tests than any other state in the country by far. Um, it's limited in terms of how much you can do to protect nursing homes. So uh, that is a major challenge. And as long as we don't have our outbreaks under control, it's going to be very hard to protect nursing homes because they need workers. Oh, it's a shame. I want to get back to talking about schools. We, we've mentioned it a bit and we're getting some more audience questions about it. There's a lot of questions about reopening them. And as we're just talking about several of the California large school districts have already said, we're not going to bring people back in person. New York City, the largest school district in the country, I believe, has a bit of a hybrid approach, uh, which is challenging, of course, for the, the families that have those children. Um, but starting with K through 12, you know, what do we know about infection and transmission in K through 8 and also in high school students? And what should that tell us about what we can do this fall? Well, let me start just a couple of things. Um, so what, what do we definitely know? That kids are less likely to get sick when they get infected. No doubt about it. Much, much lower likelihood of getting sick, right? Okay, so that's good news. Thank goodness. And by the way, very unusual. Most viruses, uh, serious respiratory viruses, tend to actually disproportionately affect kids again in, in serious ways. So this is good news. Um, second is an, on transmission. Now I'm going to get into like a little bit of hand waving, and you're going to see me say, I believe and I think, because the data is not all that clear, but I believe that the data is pretty suggestive that kids under 10 really do transmit a lot less. 17-year-olds, um, they're adults. They, I think they kind of transmit the way 24-year-olds do. And somewhere between 17 and 10, there's a, you know, kind of a gradient and, and it's sort of... So what that has meant to me is thinking, well, could we be a bit more aggressive about K through 3, K through 5, and maybe treat high schoolers a bit more like adults? Um, but... but the other part of the problem that always is really important to bring up is that you can't run schools without adults. 
And so even imagine if kids didn't transmit at all. Let's say we were sure there was zero transmission from kids. You'd still have to think about how do you deal with teachers and staff uh, spending large amounts of time indoors with each other. So it's a challenge, um, but that's what we know, or that's what I understand the evidence to be. But Bob, you may have a different take on this. I think that's a totally up-to-date understanding of the evidence. Um, the only thing I'd add, though, is that we've learned in the same time period as we've learned those perspectives is that indoor spaces are worse than we thought. Um, the virus floats in the air as an aerosol for longer than we could expect. We thought, actually, it was droplets and they would fall to the ground and then, you know, you could disinfect them away and, and that would be okay. Um, we have learned since that this virus is in the air for, for much longer. So you have these clouds of COVID that float around indoor environments. And so you need great ventilation to get the air out. And most school buildings in this country are, are not ventilated in an awesome way. Uh, and so that means that an adult who comes to school as a teacher who breathes out COVID into communal spaces will affect, in fact, the other teachers and maybe the students too. Uh, and so that's a giant problem that we have to figure out how we're gonna deal with. That's why um, ways to create smaller schools, um, create more location for better ventilation um, are important aspects of this as well. Um, I do think that you can imagine, you know, everything from, you know, preschool through fifth grade, you know, being handled differently than middle school and high school. Uh, but you have this giant challenge of it's putting people together and it's math. It's like, if you're infected and breathing that virus, if someone comes into contact with you for a while, they'll breathe in that virus and get infected. It's, it's simple. And so we haven't figured out how to deal with that aspect of schools, which is why we need more time, I think, to get to a place where we can then more safely open schools after we've done these sort of thoughtful redesigns of the school. Real challenge for different school districts, which have different, most of which are underfunded. And of course they have various, they're not very big. Uh, we take for granted here that every town and city has its own school district, whereas in a lot of countries, there's only one school district and they could do the central and we can't. That's a real challenge. You know, let's talk about college. I've got a particular couple dogs in this hunt because I got I have two daughters planning to attend college very soon. One a senior at a small college, one a fresh a first year at a large university. Both expect to be on campus in the fall, but already know that they will have probably not a single class in person, but still want to be on campus anyway and do what they can do. Uh, what I hate to ask this question because I hate to hear your answer, but what do you expect will happen to the colleges, some of which are bringing, I know that Harvard is not, for example, but some of which are bringing students back to campus this fall and trying to be careful. How well do you think that's going to work? Do you, you want to start? You're, you're, you're at a college. I am. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to talk about Harvard or Brown. So I'm leaving Harvard to go to start Brown in September. So I'm going to keep it not personal and kind of more broad. Um, though I, I'm happy to talk about those places too. Uh, I have reviewed probably 20 or 30 different universities opening plans. And I've been talking to a lot of university leaders. And when I, after reviewing most of the plans, my general guess, what I say to them is, uh, if you want my honest assessment, I think the majority of them are going to be closed by Columbus Day. Um, that is not the same as saying it is not possible. I'm saying it is going to take a tremendous amount of work. So what do I mean? Bob actually has listed several of the things. Uh, these universities are not really serious about improving ventilation in their buildings. A lot of these universities that I've been talking to have 250 year old buildings and ventilation, the latest air purifiers and the, all that stuff is not, is not what they have. They need to take a very different approach. There are universities that say to me, well, can we test 20% of our staff and faculty every week as our testing strategy? And I'm like, sure, that's a good way to identify a large outbreak after it's happened. Um, it'll just tell you that it's time to shut down. But it's not a surveillance strategy. It will not get you, it will not let you act in a way that prevents that massive outbreak. Um, so there are all of these challenges and my take is universities are desperate to open, many of them for financial reasons. And I, by the way, that's not a critique, like being financially solvent is, is part of their you know, fiduciary responsibility. Um, 
they are underappreciating how incredibly hard it is going to be to keep it open. I think colleges and universities can. I'm not sure you can open up and, and keep a college open in Houston, Texas right now, but I think you should be able to do it in San Francisco, and I think you should be able to do it in Boston, but it is going to take a tremendous amount of work. The nuance is that just like nursing homes, it depends upon the prevalence and spread of COVID outside of the university. Because as much as a university would like to be a bubble and keep everybody on the campus and not leave, that, that's impossible. And so people will come off, you know, go, will come out and come back. And the more often someone goes off campus and gets infected and comes back, the harder it is to keep that university open. Uh, and so that's the first thing is that local prevalence will matter a ton. The second thing is, uh, being much more ambitious about thinking about what are the things where we need to have people together and make sure you only bring people together for things that are critical. There's probably some laboratory classes, some studio classes uh, where you must bring a small group of people together, but the key is small groups of people together for things that really have to happen. Uh, what I fear is that universities will get lax and allow students to start congregating uh, in much less strict ways. Um, and maybe they'll be social uh, because they're university kids. And as soon as that occurs, I think you lose control of your ability to maintain this virus because the whole name of the game is unfortunately not letting people who are infected be in contact with people who aren't. Um, and the more you put people together, uh, the more you're gonna have a controlled spread. And then you're just sort of wondering when it happens. Uh, and most universities, as she says, if they open, I think they're gonna struggle and you know close sometime between Columbus Day and Thanksgiving because they're not gonna be able to maintain the physical distancing required and they don't have the ventilation or the spaciousness uh, to, mm -hmm. to really bring people back. So you're picking Halloween or so, I guess. Somewhere uh, there. <laughs> I've got a couple big picture questions from our audience. I'll throw one of them at each of you. Uh, Bob, what advice would you give the federal government right now about managing the pandemic? Not that they've asked you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Dr. Fauci. Uh, <laughs> what right. I would say is uh, we need to be a lot more ambitious about mm -hmm. manufacturing the supplies we need. Uh, for the economy to be vibrant, we'll need to be able to do lots of testing very quickly all over America at low cost. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need the federal government to actually use the Defense Production Act to make things. Uh, mm -hmm. We should be making all the testing supplies and reagents here um, because remember the whole world needs the same stuff. And so if we're all trying to buy it from the same factory in China, we'll get some, but we're not gonna get all of it. And so we need to have more domestic manufacturing of testing supplies. PPE is another big thing. Um, one of the ways you reopen schools and universities and businesses is you put high-risk people in PPE. And we do not have enough of that today to do it. Uh, we need more PPE and more masks. Um, you can reprocess some of it, but we need more. Uh, we need more ventilators too. And we, we've not made many. We talked about GM you know, conceptually making ventilators, but we haven't made more. Uh, and right now the country is not in a crisis, but that's the perfect time to be making this stuff. We need to do that. The federal government should be using its convening power to bring the best scientists and manufacturers together to figure out not just how to do Operation Warp Speed for a, for a vaccine, but a similar operation to actually create new tests that are really cheap and really accurate. What we have now is really accurate PCR tests and not much else. We need to have, we need to have the next generation sequencing tests work really well, and we need other tests too. Uh, and so we need to actually have a Manhattan project you know, that, that does that. And, the, and only the federal government can really create that program because they have the, the tools of the budget and the FDA to make that happen. Um, federal government needs to be, you know, also simple about the messages around masks work. We need to wear them. This isn't like a con this isn't complicated. Like this is a virus that you breathe out. You gotta, you gotta like wear a mask. Um, the federal government should be a lot more nuanced about schools. It's not open or closed. The, the discussion we just had of how do you do it? Uh, and they need money behind that. And the federal government should be a lot clearer too about like, how long this is going to take. Um, this virus isn't going away, um, unfortunately, in the fall. In fact, it's going to be a lot more challenging because flu season happens in the fall. And our hospitals in America are normally totally full from just seasonal flu. And we know that. And so we will have a flu season just like every other year. And we have COVID. And so we can look ahead and say, how do I make sure I can manage that? So what are the changes you make to hospital planning, collective surgeries, um, and prepare people for in the, in the winter uh, so that we're not surprised um, and not caught flat-footed again? So I think that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big agenda for the federal government, but 
Um, until it embraces that agenda, I think we're going to be in this middle state, which is worse, which is this frog in a pot where it's worse every day. Uh, and if you don't sort of change what you're doing, it's, it's not going to get better. Okay. Thanks for the answer. Before I turn to Ashish, she's got a couple of small questions for you, quick questions about testing. One is about saliva samples and whether we're going to have those anytime soon that are accurate enough uh, to help. Yeah, saliva sampling can work very well. Uh, there's now many labs across the country using saliva-based sampling, and it's um, certainly a better approach because you don't need the world's most expensive swabs anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I think you'll see more of that. Which is great. And how soon after the initial infection can it be detected by the current tests? Three or four days is sort of when you begin to be confident that you're going to recover it and, and know. Mm -hmm. If I, uh, if I thought I might've been exposed and want to go quarantine myself, you know, 14 days is a long time. Can I just go quarantine myself and after day four get tested? And if I'm clear, stop the quarantine? Yes. Good. Thank you. That, that could save me a lot of time. Ashish, here's the big picture question for you. It's kind of a serious then basically it's really about predicting the future. What do you see in the next three, six, 12 months and give us your best guess. And then how about the best plausible scenario and maybe the worst plausible scenario you could see too. All right, so I'll lay out three scenarios. Um, the horrible, the super optimistic, and then maybe the middle one that is probably most likely. Sure. Um, the horrible, it's funny because on some days I feel like any of those three is the most likely, but uh, let me try my best. And this is all hard, right? Because we don't know. The worst outcome, the worst scenario going forward, just to start with that, because I don't want to end with that, is we basically don't get serious about con containing the virus in the places that are neck deep. And those places really do start drowning and you just have incredible numbers of people dying. The, the way steep states, many of them start, and they're right there, right? They're really close to going into exponential growth. Uh, many of them head down that path. And we have a rest of the summer going into fall with 80, 100,000 new cases a day, 1,000 deaths a day, and then the flu season hits. And we get unlucky and our flu vaccine is worse than normal in terms of its coverage. And uh, we go to, through a very bleak fall and winter where our hospitals are overwhelmed, people are dying. And we emerge sometime in the spring with a vaccine that's meddling in terms of how good it is and offers some protection, but not others. And next year, by June, July, many of us have gotten vaccinated, but five, 600,000 Americans have died. I think that is a really bleak scenario. I don't think that's the most likely scenario. I want to lead with that just because I want to put it on the table because it is not a, it is not a completely off the table scenario. It could happen. And by the way, which of these three happen is very much up to us. Um, the really optimistic scenario is that the, the, the neck deep states go, oh my God, we can't run our economy this way. They get very aggressive in the next couple of weeks. They largely shut down. Uh, the waist deep states uh, look at the neck deep states and say, we don't wanna be that. And they really start ratcheting down. And the ankle deep states also just really maintain stuff. By the time we get into the fall, uh, things are really starting to get better. We're down to 10, 15, 20,000 cases a day at most. Uh, very maybe a couple hundred deaths or less, and we get some fabulous new tests. Uh, the CRISPR tests become available, and they are cheap and easy. And uh, you can spit into a cup and drop a little thing in, and you'll get a result in 10, 15 minutes. And they become widely available. Um, and while some schools are closed, uh, many of the schools start being able to open up. Our case numbers continue low. By late fall, we have a couple of vaccines, doctors and nurses start getting them. And by January, February, large numbers of us have gotten vaccinated. And by March, April, things are much, much better. And maybe 200, 250,000 Americans have died. I don't think that's at all un impossible either. I like, just when I told that, I said, oh, yeah, I could see that could happen. Um, I'm partly looking at Bob's reactions to like, is he thinking this is crazy or is he thinking, yeah, I could see that. And then the middle scenario is somewhere in between, right? And, and here's the key point about the middle scenario, which is I think the most likely, which is, is you're gonna see two or three different things, two or three different Americas. You're gonna see a set of Americas that's gonna to continue to struggle with wearing masks, 
continue to struggle with the politicization of basic stuff, uh, large outbreaks, and then a chunk of America that is going to say, we don't want that future. That's not what we want and is going to be aggressive and is going to keep a tight lid on things. Um, we will get, I think, better testing and, and places like California and Massachusetts and Michigan and, and Ohio will employ them in a way that will let their economies function, not at 100 um, percent, but but at 80 percent. And um, and I do think we'll have a vaccine early in 2021. I hope it'll be better than kind of mediocre in its efficacy. And I think that next summer, the three of us could be sitting together uh, indoors in uh, having dinner. I think that is possible. And I think that is in fact quite possible. And that's the more kind of middle scenario. Uh, not that everything turns out off, uh, awesome, but not that everything turns out awful. Well, I say it, it is much within our control and it's both what the government does and the individual personal responsibility we all take. Yeah. Terrific. We are uh, running out of time. We have time for just one last question. So I'm going to ask the same question to each of you, since the Commonwealth Club is all about informed discussion and informing our listeners. Here's the question. And um, Bob, I'll give this to you first. What's the biggest public misperception about the pandemic? Oh, man. Um, I think that the disease is not bad. I think I've heard people say maybe we should go get infected so we can get get over it and and then live our live our lives again. And I think that is a terrible me. Um, I have taken care of patients who get incredibly sick and they were incredibly healthy when they started out. And we don't know um, what are the long-term effects of having had COVID-19. And so I think people need to take it seriously. This is this is not this is much worse than the flu uh, with higher mortality and probably longer term ramifications. At any at any age, we should be worried about it. Yeah, thanks. Ashish, what do you think is the biggest public misperception? Yeah, just very quickly on Bob's point, and then I want to give a slightly bit, you know, I have a colleague who was infected, uh, spent three weeks in the ICU, uh, got discharged about a month ago. And I was talking to him this past weekend. He's a pretty healthy guy in his 40s, ran the Boston Marathon two years ago. He says he still can't stand for a shower because he gets so short of breath. Um, um, this is, you know, this is two months after his infection, a guy who ran the marathon. So yeah, not taking this lightly is the thing. I'm going to give a slightly uh, broader answer, which is to me, the biggest challenge of this has been the incredible amount of misinformation that we have. And, and so whether it's about masks, it's about how severe or how mild this illness is, you know, we have, um, and, you know, we have this incredible campaign of misinformation uh, not to pick on any particular platform, but particularly run through Facebook, uh, that has just created a large chunk of America that sees this virus totally differently. These are, I know some of these people, they're reasonable people, they're thoughtful people, uh, family members who basically say, I can't believe you're making such a big deal about this. And the constant flow of misinformation is what is killing us. If there's one thing that could turn this entire pandemic around, it is to find a way to stench that flow of that misinformation because it makes everything incredibly hard. It lets us have fights about mass. We shouldn't be fighting about mass. It makes us fight about every single part of the response. And I really think that companies that are uh, essentially platforms for promoting that misinformation have to take responsibility that they have now become the source of why our pandemic is going so badly. And I wanna see action because other than that, it's going to be very, very hard for us to get our act together and be where we need to be. Well, thanks. Thanks for those answers. Before we close the program, I want to remind the audience to visit us regularly at CommonwealthClub.org to stay informed about the programs the Commonwealth Club is producing in association with Zetima Project on COVID-19. And now I want to give a big thanks to Ashish Jha and Bob Kosher, both for joining us virtually and also for all the important work you're doing. We need to solve this problem and, and combat this disease. And I really appreciate both of your leadership in that regard. Thanks also to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and to our other donors. If you enjoyed this program, I encourage you to make a donation yourself to support the Commonwealth Club and its nonprofit programs. I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>